Welcome to the Eternity Online Service. Great you could join us today. This is the day the Lord has made and we're looking forward to having some joy together, some excitement, some fellowship, and we're also going to be praising God, listening to His Word and praying for you. Let's sing together. Let's worship Him. Praise Him with this song.
God is with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He loves you. So let's open our heart right at this time to hear what he has to say. Father God, we thank you so much that you're with us, you're in us, you're guiding us. You've given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through your great and precious promises that by these we might be made partakers of the divine nature. And Father, I pray for everybody listening to us today, being a participant on this service, that you'll move in their hearts and their lives right now. We claim peace. We bind up every work of the enemy in Jesus' name. We silence the voices of darkness and we release the peace and the glory of God over every viewer in Jesus' name. Yes, we do pray for that peace, for all that turmoil to just quieten down right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you are the provider of every need. Our needs are met in you. And those that are a little bit stressed about provision, we declare right now that that need is met. We declare provision coming in in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's somebody that's been having a twinge of carpal tunnel syndrome in one of their wrists. And I think you've had it before and you're concerned about this coming again in the other wrist. And in the name of Jesus, we just pray right now and we stand against this. We stand against this in any form of weakness or dropping things. And we just pray today, Father, that there would be a complete opening up of that tunnel, that there'd be no pressure on the nerve and that everything there would function and work properly in Jesus' name. I pray for someone's knee right now. And you may have even fallen over and scraped that knee. Well, I just declare that there will be no internal damage, that it will be healed in the name of Jesus and every external bit of damage totally healed in Jesus' name. And the reason for that fall perhaps is um, strengthened in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you are healer, strengthener, 
in Jesus' name. I'm praying for somebody today and you've had a car accident and you've experienced a little bit of delayed shock and your confidence has been knocked around by this. So I'm praying for you today in Jesus' name. We stand against this. We just declare it's a happening, it's happened, it's past, it's over. And Father, I pray for that person today to have peace in their heart, confidence about driving some more, and that they will know that your angels have been given charge over them, that they'll be protected as they drive, and that their future is going to be okay. We pray confidence, blessing, and divine wisdom in Jesus' name. I pray for someone right now, and you need supernatural wisdom for a particular financial situation. I just declare in the name of Jesus that you will hear the word of the Lord and know what to do, what to say in this situation. Father, we just declare it, your wisdom coming forth in the name of Jesus. Praying for somebody today and your ankle joint has become quite inflamed and it's really, really painful and it's hard for you to walk and it's made life stressful. And in the name of Jesus, we stand against that inflammation, that pain, the cause of it, the root and the fruit of it. I rebuke it in Jesus' name and I command all of that pain, that inflammation to go out from there. And I ask, Father, for a mighty miracle of the Holy Spirit upon that person right now, the tingling, the power of God all over them, touching that ankle in Jesus' name. And I encourage you to receive to keep on receiving and then when you've really encountered God get up and start walking by faith and keep claiming that by his stripes I am healed in Jesus name. I pray for someone with a problem in a muscle in the right forearm and I just declare healing right now the root cause of that thing being healed in Jesus name and that being manifest right now healing in Jesus name and father I'm praying right now for everybody that's apprehensive about the future mm. there are many mixed reports that are coming out there's even words from the prophets that are coming that tempt us to feel insecure frightened or alarmed about what's ahead but in Jesus name father we thank you that those that dwell in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and a thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but will not come near you. And even in the land of Goshen, when Egypt was going through all the plagues, those that were God's people that put the blood of the Lamb on their lintel, they were protected and safe. And I want to encourage you that God is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before His presence, that you can be safe that all things can work together for you. And in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, that the angels have been given charge over us. And I pray for all of these people today that they will have peace in Jesus' name. Yes, I just want to encourage you to get a hold of Psalm 91 and just continue to let it be a part of you. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And it just continues on with great encouragement for us. He's our protector. He's our strength. He's the one looking after us. Just believe today that He is with you and looking after you. So as we move on with the singing now and the worship and praise, let the Spirit of God minister to you. You need peace, mm. He is peace. You need healing, He is the healer. You need revelation and wisdom from God. This is available to you right now. Yeah. So just receive as you continue to worship Him. You were the word the beginning One with God the Lord most high Hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you Our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You 
didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Our sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name. Your name is 
Angels are active. I want to encourage you today to look at life a whole lot deeper than what we can see with our physical eyes. No need to If you look at what is going on around us only from a physical perspective, then we could get very discouraged. We could be tempted to fear, to worry, to be anxious, or even try to fix things in our own physical strength. The most powerful thing that we can do is pray and have our eyes opened to the spiritual realm. The book of Hebrews in 13.2 says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Sometimes angels are helping us without us even knowing. I can remember once, we were driving home after doing a huge outreach concert. Suddenly, from a truck coming in the other direction, a huge two by four plank of wood came hurtling toward us. It flew right through the windscreen, shattering it and was suddenly stopped by the dashboard. If it had have been only a quarter of an inch higher, it would have speared Dave right through the face. Whichever way you look at it, his life was supernaturally spared. In Psalm 91, we have some great promises. Verse 11 says, He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. It also says, I will be with him in trouble. Take note, it says in the trouble, God is with you. I would much rather be rescued from the trouble, but that is not what it says. We need to stay close to God, listen for His voice, listen to His voice, guiding us through the trouble. 
there is more trouble coming. We cannot fix things in our own physical strength. We need our eyes opened to the unseen realm. In the book of 2 Kings, Elisha had to teach his servant. They were surrounded by a great army of horses and chariots. Elisha said, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then he prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And he saw the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We need our eyes opened. Thank you, Lord, for lifting up the blindfold from my eyes. Revealing truth inside my heart, dispelling all the lies. Thank you, Lord, for coming and allowing me to see. As I reflect on all you've done, I fall on bended knee. Now I'm rising. I know that I am now where I belong. Now I'm rising. With you, I know that I can now stand strong. To believe the impossible, we have to see the invisible. We are in the world, but we are not of it. Don't accept everything that is coming our way. We are not subject to what is going on. We do not need to fear. We may have to get ready and be prepared for what is coming and follow instructions to get through the trouble, but he is with us in the trouble. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. God is moving behind the scenes and he will keep us protected. Angels are working on our behalf. They're working on your behalf. Hebrews 1.14 Are not the angels all ministering spirits sent out in the service of those who are to inherit salvation. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. God has angels assigned to us through the struggles that are going on all around us. We all need help, whether it's spiritual, financial or emotional and help is available for us right now. Would rocks cry out to worship Whose glory taught the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But this joy is mine With the thousand high we magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours 
thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means our rise? There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is for The book of Job says, how forcible are right words. And in the book of Proverbs, it says in 1821, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Today, we're talking about the law of confession. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today and look into it, we're asking that you'd flood us with your spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the light of your revelation would flood into our hearts and help us to see the unseen, to know what isn't naturally known, and to really perceive what it is that you want us to understand from the Word of God today. And Father, we pray for the grace of God to enable us to be able to do what we're reading, not just learn about it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, that's the law of confession today. Our theme is how to tame your tongue. And I'm going to start by reading a long section of scripture 
And this is found in James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and this is actually all about the tongue. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. And as a further foundation for this message today, let's review what we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks, where Jesus taught clearly that we will have what we say. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. That's very, very important that we need to understand this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can have what you say. So the question again comes up today, how do we tame our tongue? Because it's very, very important. And we're reading there in the book of James, the tongue can be set on fire by hell. We don't want that. But it also says no man can tame the tongue. It has to be tamed. The question is, how do we tame it? Now, let me give you some examples of the law of confession in operation. I remember when I got that first gas bill after I decided to live by faith, and I put it up and I spoke to it and I said, you're paid in the name of Jesus. It was a $60 bill, an anonymous $60 check came in the mail and paid for it. I learned how to say, by his stripes I am healed. My God shall supply all of my needs. This is a couple of scriptures that I started with from the beginning because I really needed them. And I confess this ever since. It's been over 40 years of saying these same scriptures. I have the mind of Christ. I am one spirit with the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and no weapon formed against me will prosper. And I found one that said, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. I had to stand on those scriptures so much every time I preached. But the law of confession is a law. You can have what you say. And the more I say it and the more I've said it, I do live it and experience it now. Amen. John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He confessed over his life what he found out about himself from the scriptures. Jesus said this, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And then he said to his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of the Gentiles. They'll mock me. They'll scourge me. They'll crucify me. But on the third day, I will rise again. Jesus confessed what the father showed him would happen. But he confessed on the third day, I will rise again. And it happened as he said it. Just before Jesus' crucifixion, he was praying to his father and he made an astounding statement. He said, I am no longer in the world. Now to an observer, 
it might have looked like he was still in the world because his feet were still on the earth. But he spoke his confession of what he believed and what he said came to pass. In the Old Testament, Abram changed his name to Abraham, meaning the father of many nations. He confessed it over himself. I am the father of many nations. But he kept saying it, kept believing it. Even getting a baby doesn't make you the father of many nations. It takes a lot more than just one baby. The baby has to live. The baby has to grow up. The baby has to continue that vision into the next and next and next generations. Abraham obviously was the father of Ishmael and Isaac, which became separate nations. And then Isaac was the father of Jacob and Esau, which also became separate nations. So in that sense, Abraham had already become the father of many nations in two generations. All of us, when we become Christians, we have to activate the law of confession. Because the Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Believing and confessing is the only way to be saved from an eternity in hell. And if you haven't been saved and received Jesus' new birth, there'll be an opportunity before this message concludes today. So let's all say it now. Jesus is Lord. Amen. So let's have a look today and see what the Bible teaches us about how do we tame our tongue. Number one today is understand what your tongue is capable of, because this will greatly motivate you to realize that taming the tongue is crucial. James 3, 1 to 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. Now, now listen to this. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Did you see that? You can bridle your body. You see, if you get your tongue right, everything else can fall into line. If your tongue's sick, your body will be sick. If your tongue's prosperous, your body will be prosperous. If your tongue's full of joy, your body will be happy. Amen. If you bridle the tongue and don't stumble in word, everything else is going to fall into line. Then James gives a series of illustrations to clarify his point. The first illustration is a bit in a horse's mouth. This is James 3.3. 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Interesting. A horse's flesh power and strength is a lot bigger than a man's. But if you can get that bit in where the horse's tongue is in its mouth, you can control the horse. Now, I've only ridden horses a couple of times, and I'm sure some of you are far more experienced at it than me. But what I believe is right, if the bit is in the horse's mouth, as long as he doesn't crunch the bit and you pull it, you don't have to pull it very hard for him to get a very clear message. And sometimes his tongue might react and stick out and carry on. But pressure on the tongue in the corner of his mouth turns his whole body. And all of that strength is harnessed. On the farm I was on, we didn't have any horses, but we had a big bull. And the objective was to get a ring in the bull's nose when he was a calf. Because later on, you just need one of those great big rods with a clipper on the end. And you hook it into the ring on the bull's nose. And he'll go anywhere you lead him then because it's very tender. It's the same kind of idea. If you can pull him by the ring in his nose, he will go where he needs to go because he doesn't like the pain. Amen. So I want to say it again. To get your body to go in the direction you want it to go, you've got to get the tongue to say what needs to be said. How do we do that? That's what we're coming to. The second illustration that James gives is the rudder on a ship or the steering mechanism. In James 3 verse 4 he says, Look at the ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Amen. Now the ships we have today, these passenger ships and cargo ships, are huge. And even the huge warships, they've got so much momentum 
and they're going in a given direction. If the captain wants to change directions, maybe he gives instructions to the helmsman, but he turns the direction and there's a rudder down the back of the ship under the water, no one can see what's doing this, it turns and initially it's just plowing water, it's pressure on the rudder, pressure on the back of the boat, but after a while it starts to turn and the whole thing starts to turn around and to go where you want it to go. They didn't have cars back then, the same could be said. Even driving the biggest of trucks, turning the steering wheel, changes the direction of the wheels, it changes the whole direction of the tons and tons of weight and the huge horsepower strength. It will change if the rudder is set and it stays in until the direction is set. And it's the same with our mouth. When we first start making a new confession, it doesn't change direction straight away. It's not talking about a windsurfer here, he's talking about a ship. You have to hold your course, keep saying it, and eventually it will turn. You know, some of those ships are so big, I believe they have to switch off the engines miles out from port so that it doesn't just drive straight through the whole town when it gets there. It's a lot of momentum, but it can be directed by the guy turning the steering wheel. Amen. We have to learn how to change the steering wheel of our life and make sure it's going in the direction that's going to be wholesome, holy, good, profitable, beneficial to us and others, and will be pleasing to God. The third illustration James gives is kindling a fire. Reading now James chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Wow, we have to really, really watch this because this illustration is mostly negative about the destructive power that can come through our tongue. And going through this backwards, he says, the tongue gets set on fire by hell. In other words, the devil puts ideas into your mind. He feeds them in, feeds them in. And we know from last week that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we're watching the wrong things, listening to the wrong things, musing on the wrong things, imagine ourselves doing the wrong things. If we keep this up, those words will be in our heart. And then when the time comes, they're going to come out. They'll come out when you're under pressure. They will come out when you're least expecting it. But what's in there in abundance will come out. And if it's set on fire by hell, it will defile the whole body. And I know they have that saying, loose lips sink ships. And we have to be aware that sometimes the whole body here is the body of Christ or a local church. We can't just let the devil's words come out of our mouth. It's defiling many things. It's like a little fire can start a forest fire. Now, kindling, in Australia, we didn't use the word kindling when I was a boy. We used to call it sticks, and sometimes it's a sticks that come off the trees, and sometimes you get a piece of wood and cut it down into fine sticks. You stack them over a piece of paper, light that, the sticks start, you put the bigger wood on and a backlog, and then the whole thing burns. And I grew up till I was well and truly moving away from home at the age of about 20. And all the way up till then, we had open fires and they all started the same way. But by the end of the night, when the fire's done its job, you cannot find any evidence of the match, the paper or the kindling. Amen. It's gone. And it's like this. A whole forest can burn from one match. You can't find the match afterwards, but you can sure see the devastation. And it's often like that with loose lips the wrong tongue. You might not be able to trace it back to who said the wrong thing, but you can be sure if it's destructive, it will set on fire by hell, just like this passage says. Amen. So we've got to learn how to tame the tongue. Now I'm going to read now Matthew 15, 11, then 17 to 20. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? 
But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus is again speaking about this from the negative point of view. He's talking about what defiles a man and no doubt what can defile the whole body. So again, I have to warn you, the devil is always pressing you to say his words. One way he does it, he gets you to watch so much things on television, you know, reality television. He gets you to watch the negative news. He wants you to muse on things and to think over things that are going wrong and to talk about it. And he also wants you to think silly things in your heart. Jesus talked there about evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness and blasphemies. If these things are in our heart, and we meditate on them or muse on them, think about them, see ourselves doing it or as it or with it, think about it, I'm going to get that guy one day, and think about all that unforgiveness, these words will come out the mouth. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that power will affect your life. And it will lead you into some of these actions or it will just lead you into a bitterness or being caught in the root of bitterness and defile many people. So the Bible says to us to resist the devil. In James 4, 7, he says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We have to be vigilant. We have to be aware. And one of the only ways to do this is to stay in the word of God. It's like when they teach bank tellers how to spot counterfeits. They don't show them counterfeit notes. They get them to become very familiar with the real notes so they know exactly what it's like what it feels like and then when they see something slightly different they can pick up on it and we have to be the same we have to keep in the word of god we have to keep it before our eyes we have to meditate in it day and night we have to muse on the word of god think about it see yourself in it with it as it saying it doing it having it You've got to see yourself in that word. Meditate on it till you can see it happening before you. And then once you know what the word of God says and you've got to study it, learn it, analyze it, do Bible college if you have to, do something to get the Bible in. And when you do, then you can spot the lies of the enemy. And wherever you're at a place where you're just not sure, you're on the cutting edge of where your mind is renewed to and you have to keep working in that area until you get your mind renewed to the truth so that the current work of the devil can be spotted and stopped. Submit to God, you know, submit to his word to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And the best way to resist him is to find out what the truth is from God's word and say to the devil, it is written just exactly the same way Jesus did it, he will flee. And the Bible also says to give no place to the devil. In Ephesians 4.27, do not give the devil an opportunity to work. And one of the best ways about that is bridle the tongue. Amen. James's fourth illustration along this line is about taming a wild animal. This is James 3, 7 to 8. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Now it says no man can tame the tongue, but it does not say the tongue can't be tamed. You cannot tame your tongue by willpower. You can't just decide from now on, I'm not going to say anything wrong. Save yourself the heartache and realize that that's not how it's done. You need willpower. You need willpower to keep up and maintain your confession. And your willpower can do a lot of good. But in the final end of the day conclusion, you need supernatural help. And that's one of the reasons why the Bible says that God gave us the special gift of speaking in other tongues. 
If you ask for that gift and receive God's Holy Spirit, you can receive that gift. And with that gift, you got no control over the words that come out of your mouth, but you do have control over when you start and when you stop. And then you know that the tongue is being used properly. It's speaking very positive and powerful things. No man can tame it, but the Holy Spirit can. Amen. He can tame your tongue and he can use that gift of tongues to get your tongue to say so many good things that your life is going to go in a much better direction. Amen. And also we tame our tongue by making sure our heart is filled to overflowing with the word of God. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and that overflow will tame the tongue. So the Holy Spirit and the word of God are the only forces strong enough to tame the tongue. The human being can't do it by their own power, but the supernatural divine power, we could call it the grace of God, can tame the tongue and get it to say what needs to be said. Now, James goes on to a fifth illustration, and this one is about a fountain or a spring of water giving out sweet water and bitter water. This is James chapter 3, 8 to 12. And he's talking of the tongue. It is an unruly. That means it can't be controlled by us. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth both fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh, because if you mix salt and fresh water together, it's going to be salt water. So we don't want to have a salty attitude, a salty taste in our mouth. We want to speak that which is good, that's used for edifying, for building others up, communicating love, etc. Plus, another motivating factor in this whole process is that we have to give an account for every idle word that we have spoken. And remember, you can't tame your tongue yourself. You need God, the Holy Spirit, and God's word in your heart to tame it. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is Jesus speaking. There's no question about this. And I know that there are some people who would prefer not to face this truth because they haven't found out how you tame the tongue. So then they try to shift this into a softer option and say, well, it doesn't really mean you have to give an account for your words. Well, that's what it says. What we have to understand is how to tame the tongue. That's the big issue. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now, John chapter 12, verses 47 to 8 says, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So Jesus is saying it again. We are judged for every idle word and we are compared to every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth. Now, the words that came out of Jesus' mouth, a lot of them are written down and we can compare what we say to what he said. And if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. And we're able to look at what he says, look at what we say. And where there's a difference, we repent, ask for forgiveness and move on. Now, again, this is confirmed in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, where the Holy Spirit re-mentions this and clarifies it a bit further. Here we go. Now, this one's a little hard to understand on the grammar, but I'm going to emphasize the subject of this whole paragraph or sentence is for the word of God. Amen. The word of God's the subject. For the word of God is living and all efficient and much sharper than a double-edged sword, 
and it pierces to the separation of soul and spirit and of joints, marrow and of the bones, and it judges the reasoning and conscience of the heart. And there is no created thing hidden from before him. Now him always refers back to the previously mentioned subject. So the him is referring back to the word of God. There is no created thing hidden from before him. But everything is naked and open before the eyes of him to whom we give an account. Again, the him is referring back to the word of God. And Jesus said, I don't judge you. It's the words that I've spoken will judge you. Isn't that what he just said? We just read it in John chapter 12. So it's confirmed here in the book of Hebrews that the word of God is living. He will be the one to whom we give an account. So again, it comes back to our words they will justify us or condemn us. And right now, no doubt, many of us have got a lot of words we need to repent of, ask forgiveness for. And if you've never been born again, right now is the right time to seek God about that and seek that new birth. And he said it's not complicated to receive it. First thing we do is we acknowledge that we have sinned, that we are far from God, and that we have grieved him by our lifestyle. The second thing is that we acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He carried our sins on the cross. He died because of them. And then he was in the grave for three days as the consequence of our sin. But his own blood was sufficient to pay for all of that sin. So on the third day, the Father was able to raise him up from the dead, proving that our sin was paid for. So if we believe today that Jesus rose from the dead, we will also be believing that our sin was paid for. And then if we confess that Jesus is Lord and we put our life fully and completely into his hands to guide us, that's confessing Jesus is Lord, we receive his new birth, which is a brand new beginning in life as though we'd never sinned. It's called being justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. And then we follow Jesus as our good shepherd. Now today, that's all a little complicated, but to get you started, I'll lead you through a prayer. And if you say this prayer, you say it to God, genuinely mean it with all of your heart, then he will change your life. He will come into your life and you'll be born again. And all of your past up to this moment will just be completely gone. All your sin, everything you've ever done wrong, will be gone. And then from this point onwards, if you find you still have a sin here and there, then you confess your sin and he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. So say this prayer after me if you know you need the Lord. Say this, Jesus, you repeat that. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I confess I was a sinner. I turned from my old life. I believe you rose from the dead, proving that my sin is paid for. I receive you as my Saviour. I confess that you are my Lord, and I receive your new birth in Jesus' name. From this day forward, I will follow you as my Good Shepherd. I believe that I'm born again, that my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that Jesus is guiding my life. And I'm asking for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you. If you said that, please remember to tell somebody, read the Bible, keep praying, and be aware that you have been changed miraculously on the inside by Jesus' new birth. And if you've got no one that's a Christian to tell, please write to us on Facebook or on Messenger or on YouTube, and we will know who you are and we'll be able to pray for you. God bless you. Now I want to pray for everybody else that's heard this message today. Father, I pray for all those who hear this message that you'll work in their lives, that the supernatural power of God will come, firstly showing them where their words have been wrong, showing them how to receive forgiveness and showing them how to move on in life, 
and show them how their tongue can be tamed through the Spirit of God, through receiving the gift of tongues and by the Word of God filling and flooding their hearts in Jesus' name. Now, if you haven't received the gift of tongues, let's pray a prayer together today. And this is based on what Jesus said. If anyone asks the Father for the Holy Spirit, he will give them the Holy Spirit. So repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask for the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And I believe I receive him. And I ask you to fill me with your gift of speaking in tongues. And I believe I receive that gift right now. And as you receive, you just begin to speak, but without putting the actual words, just make the noise out through your mouth, let your tongue and your lips just go blank and let the Holy Spirit put the words on. It might seem a little strange. You start off with like... Um, and then it starts into tongues. By faith, I believe you receive, if you said that prayer, to start to speak in tongues right now and let the Holy Spirit bridle your tongue to pull your life into line, into the direction God wants it to go. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening today. Well, it has been so good to have your company today. Thank you for joining us. And until next week, we just pray that you have an awesome week. Remember to stay in the Word of God. Keep praying to God. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. And remember, there's only one way to tame the tongue. That's through the power of the Holy Spirit and the living Word of God. Until next week, from Dave and Rosanna, it's bye. bye.